Hi, I'm Ann Cleveland, the executive director of the Charleston Library Society, which has not been around as long as Harriet's uh, wonderful France, but has been in existence since 1748. We have the distinction of being America's second oldest circulating library. And so it's appropriate to, to host distinguished speakers and authors. And today having Harriet is a real treat. There's such a personal connection with Harriet because my sister-in-law, so to speak, uh, Dana Pitts, who is a dear friend of Harriet's, recommended that Harriet has a new book out and would love to speak about it. She immediately sent me a copy of the book, which I breezed through in a weekend, loving every minute of it because the time frame is of such interest to me as a history student. And so I wanna thank, first of all, Dana Pitts for introducing the Library Society to Harriet and to welcome Harriet as such a fabulous author, storyteller, and historian, and everybody is going to love this book. So I'm going to turn it over to Dutch, and I encourage all of you to buy this book as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Okay, everybody, we are just about to share some slides from Harriet. Um, Harriet Walty Rochefort grew up in Iowa, traveled to France after graduating from college, and never left. She she is the author of three nonfiction books about the French, French Toast, French Fried, and Joie de Vivre, all published by St. Martin's Press. Final Transgression, this book that we're talking about today, is her first work of fiction. So it's exciting that this is a new territory for Harriet. She currently lives in France with her French husband, Philippe, and she resides in two different places in, in France. So we'll let her talk about that later on, but I'm passing it over to you, Harriet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you can see me now or not. I can't see myself. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just delighted to uh, spend time today with the wonderful uh, Charleston Library Society. I love the name, the Library Society. That's also very unusual. And I love it also because it's so historic. I, I didn't realize that there was an institution a library that old in America. And uh, I'm very privileged to uh, be speaking to you today. I was gonna say tonight because it's we're nearing evening here in France. Um, I'm gonna uh, give you a few, uh, uh, an idea of my book and talk about a few points I think are important before I uh, show uh, with Dutch, show a few slides to uh, situate the historical context and then we'll open this up to questions. But first of all, let me tell you about uh, the, what I call the switch and the story. The switch is switching from these uh, three books you see over here, French Toast, French Fried and Joie de Vivre. They were my first uh, three books. They're all nonfiction. Um, I'll tell you very briefly about them. Uh, French Toast came about because I had been in France at that point for about 20 years. One day I sat down and I said, I don't understand this. I've, I've uh, integrated supposedly into France. I speak fluent French, except with a, an American accent. I put my kids in French schools. I go to French hospitals. I got the French health card. I mean, what more could you want? But I had observed that I was still saying, why are the French doing what they're doing? There were all these cultural gaps. And so one day I sat down and I wrote a list of what they were. And then I started doing a little riff on each list and it became a book, which was French toast and was very, very well received and, and popular as back in 1999. Since then there have been reams of similar books but it was one of the first ones. And it was a really, really fun and cathartic to do because I relaxed about the French after I uh, answered my own questions about them. And the next one was French Fried, um, the Culinary Capers of an American in France. And that one was a lot of fun too, because I interviewed everyone, starting with my mother-in-law in her French, my French mother-in-law in her French kitchen, and going up to uh, the three, uh, the nine-star chef, Alain Ducasse's head sommelier, who uh, took me to a wine tasting, a champagne tasting at the Ritz. 
and just, I had a wonderful time with that book. It was so much fun. Then the third one came about because one day I was sitting in the Metro looking at all these glum people and saying, I don't get this. I thought that the French had all this joie de vivre. In fact, they invented the term, what on earth? I just don't understand it. And once again, something I didn't understand, I decided to investigate and it became joie de vivre, secrets of whining, dining and romancing like the French. It was a lot of fun too. So I could have gone on for years writing a book about some aspect of the French. By the way, have you ever wondered why people are so fascinated by the French? I mean, does anybody write a book about the mysteries of Laplanders or, you know, the Japanese or something? No, it's the French. Now, the French have something that either irritates or interests or uh, amuses um, uh, people, and it's just never ending. So I was prepared to write another book about some aspect of that when a story presented itself to me. That story, and that's what I'm gonna tell you about right now, um, was a true story that uh, happened in my French family, in my husband's family. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you, first of all, about the fictional story. And then I will tell you about the inspiration behind it. Um, the fictional story, which you can read on the book cover, but which I'll tell you about, is about, uh, it takes place in the southwest of France. I don't know how many of you have been to France or how many of you have been to the southwest of France and Perigord. Um, it's a wonderful land of uh, prehistoric caves and foie gras and uh, it has the most woods of any place in France, which has its importance in my story. Um, and it's just a wonderful place. And that's where my mother-in-law uh, grew up. So I know a lot about the Perigord. And uh, my story, fictional story, takes place in the Perigord. And it's the story of a young girl who grows up on the grounds of a castle. She is a, um, from a poor family. Her parents work for the count countess of the castle. And the countess takes a shine to this little girl because this girl is so uh, smart and so sparkling and so enthusiastic and, and just the, the countess just loves her and she takes her under her wing and she teaches her everything. She teaches her especially the manners of the upper class and how people speak and how they carry themselves. She offers her piano lessons and Severine, that's the character, uh, learns how to play beautifully. And um, so she has a very kind of a parallel world. On one hand, she's the poor daughter of poor servants. And on the other hand, she knows exactly how to act in high society. So uh, she and her family uh, moved to Paris when she's about 18. And they are concierges in a very nice neighborhood in Paris. And uh, the uh, son of the owner of one of the apartments uh, meets and falls in love with Severine and they get married. And this isn't a problem for her to integrate into high society or this world of rich bourgeois people because she's been trained to do that. She knows how, how these people act, how they are. So there she is. And uh, things would have gone happily ever after, except that he betrays her. And her first instinct is to run back to the countess, to the village, and uh, try to work this out. She has been warned not to do this. It's 1944. And the southwest of France, especially, was a boiling cauldron of, uh, of a feroc ferocious uh, resistance and the chances that a train would get blown up or sabotaged on the way down there were very great. So all the family, all the friends said, no, Severine, you don't go down there. And of course, Severine being Severine did exactly what she planned to do and she went. And uh, she gets down there. The, by now, by 1944, of course, France is no longer um, under this system of a free zone and an occupied zone, all of France is occupied and the Germans are down there in the town she grew up in. And now the Germans are in that town 
the resistance are in the town and the milice, the collaborators are in that town. And they're all fighting among themselves, killing each other. And there she is in the middle of it. Uh, so, but nothing bothers Severine. She's, in, she's just uh, continues Severine's life because Severine is only interested in one thing. She's rather self-involved and she does want to have a family. And so this, her hopes have been dashed, but she never gives up. She's kind of like Scarlett O'Hara, you know, tomorrow's another day kind of person. So there she is. She goes back to see her childhood love who could not marry her because his mother thought she was too low class and she didn't want her precious son marrying down. So that marriage never took place, but they always loved each other. And so she gets back together with her, with him, and he betrays her too. So that's betrayal number two. And that is, okay, that sets off what she's going to do, which is, uh, which will seal her fate. What does she do? This isn't too much of a spoiler, but it is a little bit. I'll try not to give too much away. She goes to a bar where the Germans are drinking and she gets drunk. She ends up on the lap of a German officer. This does not look good. But in those times, you know, in, in ordinary times, you could do something like that. It wouldn't look good, but people would forgive you. Well, war is war, and that's not how things work. So from then on, we're on another, you know, another path. And it's not going to turn out well. And that I'll, I won't tell you any more about that because I would give the whole book away. But um, so that's the story of Severine. Now the true story, the inspiration for this book was Philippe's aunt. It was my mother-in-law's sister. And um, I'll tell you one day I was in the country house outside of Paris where we often would go for weekends and spend the weekend doing, as you can imagine, a very French thing. That's called spending the entire weekend eating and drinking. And uh, no sooner we, had, we, had we gotten through one meal that we were discussing what we would have for the next one. So, um, so uh, for some reason, I went into my mother-in-law's bedroom and she was behind me and I looked on her mantelpiece and I saw this picture I'd never seen before. And I said, oh, who's that? It was this woman, she was uh, dressed in kind of 1940s attire and she was down on all fours on the grass with a little boy on her back and she looked so happy and she was so beautiful. And I said, oh, she's beautiful. Who is that? And she said, that was my sister. And I had never heard of the sister. And I said, oh, oh, well, what happened to her? And she said, well, she died during the war. And then she didn't say anything else. And that's where um, my journalistic instincts came in because when you've got to pick up on nuances and what you have to know is my mother-in-law was a very talkative person. She was the queen of the shaggy dog story. She could turn anything into a story that had <laughs> made no sense. <laughs> and it was so much fun to listen to her talk. But here for once, she was saying nothing. And so I said, oh my goodness. Um, uh, well, I said, oh, all right, that was it. I mean, I did at least learn in my life not to speak when I know that somebody doesn't want to talk about something. So I, I just dropped it. Then I went to Philippe and I said, uh, Philippe, what do you know about your aunt? And he said, nothing really. I mean, the subject is taboo. We don't talk about her. So this really did it. So I said, listen, would you mind if I investigate this? And he said, no, I'll help you. <laughs> so, so then that, that was what uh, inspired the story. I'll tell you more about how we did that um, later on in my talk, but that was the inspiration be, be, uh, behind the story. I wanted to make a few points, but I think we can maybe take off the slide or unless you want to, no, it's okay. Oh, no, sorry. We'll, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. We can go back to that slide, Dutch. that's fine, excuse me. Um, no, I wanted to make a point about uh, this story is different from uh, many stories I read about uh, World War II in France for a few different reasons. Um, one of them is that it is uh, the, the main character, the protagonist, Severine, is neither a resistante nor a collaborator, although some people think she is, but she's not. Uh, she's an apolitical woman 
whose agenda is to have a nice life, a happy life and raise a family. How simple is that? Okay. And she goes through the war thinking this, and she is not someone who is going to be on either side of the war. She just wants to get her own life in order. And of course, very cruelly, this isn't going to happen. So uh, that's one thing. So the pro protagonist is not a spy and she's not somebody coming from elsewhere, an American spy or an English spy or somebody doing something quite dramatic. She's just this ordinary woman. Um, it's a French story set in France and all the characters are French. There's one American newsman who comes in right in the beginning and then he disappears and <laughs> all the rest of them are French. Um, if you wanted to um, say what the story could be compared to, I'll tell you what you won't compare it to. And that would be something like Lilac Girls or All the Light You Could Not See or um, Sarah's Key or any kind of Holocaust story. So I'm just situating this just to say we're in a small town in Southwest France where there is basically only uh, French, uh, French people. And so it's what the French might call a uh, Franco-Francais. That's a French term, which means French, French. It means all about us. <laughs> and it's amazing the number of times they use that expression. I love Franco-Francais. But the most important difference I think uh, is that my story um, takes place in a, a relatively unknown historical period. Now it's, it's been written about in, non, in uh, nonfiction books, history books but I haven't seen any novels about it. And I personally was very uh, uh, attracted to this period of time because I didn't really know anything about it until I knew about the story in, my, in this family. Uh, this was between about uh, May and October, 1944. Uh, you know, the war is winding down, the allies are coming, tide is turning. And all of a sudden everybody goes, oh, we're going to start settling scores. So it is a period of summary justice. And that, that place where Severine was and where my aunt, where the aunt was, uh, was the Wild West. You thought your neighbor, um, you know, was a collaborator. You go out and shoot him or hang him or kidnap him or whatever. Um, it was the Wild West, literally. And it was one of the um, foremost places in France where that happened. There, was, there, were, well, there was another very famous uh, area in France um, where that happened too. I'll just remember the name in a minute. But um, basically in, in this part of Southwest France. So people were taking justice in their own hands to uh, punish people for the way they had acted or they had allegedly acted during the war. And that's why in the novel, she's told not to go and in real life, uh, well, she was there in real life. So those are basically uh, things that are a little bit different. There is all, uh, also a lot of emphasis on social class, uh, as I said in this book, um, from, from my knowledge of living 50 years in France, um, it was uh, an area I wanted to explore. So that there's a lot of that too. Um, so I've talked about the, the, the real story and I've talked about the um, inspiration. Research, as you can imagine, <clears throat> is really important in a, an historical novel and it was very important. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we did that. Um, first of all, I'll tell you about what, what didn't happen to help us in the beginning. Uh, so here we have this story and we're at the 50th anniversary of my in-laws at their apartment in Paris. Um, not, a, not a huge apartment, uh, but yeah, not huge, not huge, not tiny, but not huge. And um, of course she, they've invited all their friends who are a certain age at that time. And I'm talking to one of the friends and all of a sudden, I mean, for no reason at all in the conversation, he says, well, that was bad business about, and he mentions the name of the aunt. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm gonna hear this story right now from this person. This is incredible. I, who was so interested, I'm gonna get it right here. And all of a sudden I looked across the room and I saw my mother-in-law drinking champagne and being happy. And I 
I saw that she wasn't that far away. And the elderly gentleman was hard of hearing and he spoke very loudly. And I put two and two together and I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. I will wreck her. She hasn't spoken about her sister for 50 years. How could I do that to her? So I, I changed the subject and I didn't get, <laughs> I said to Philip, I cannot believe this. I was that close, but no, I just couldn't do it. You know that. So I think when I, you know, go to the pearly gates in St. Peter's, you know, <laughs> there, <laughs> I can say, well, I did one good thing in my life. <laughs> so anyway, time went on and uh, we went down, we took a trip down to the Perigord and that was very revealing because this Hamlet I'm talking about where all the events happened is like, what are we talking about? Like, I don't know, a maximum of 30 houses is just little. And we walked around and we saw the layout and we, you know, cased out the joint and we were just in the street. <clears throat> this lady comes out of her house and she's sweeping in front of it. And so we introduced ourselves and we said that we were um, just interested in you know, and Philippe's aunt gave the name and she said, oh, she said, come on in and we'll have tea. And I said, oh, well, thank you. So we went in. She knew every single thing about this story because of her father. Her father was a resistant. And so she told us everything that she knew. And then she said, you should really go to see the mayor of this hamlet. Um, so we went to see the mayor. The mayor sat us down and he had a very good memory. He was younger, but he remembered everything about his parents' generation. And he told us every single thing about this story as well. And it was very interesting because when we left him, he said, uh, okay, well, it's been really um, uh, very nice to talk to you. I'm happy I could help you, but let's just keep this among ourselves. Well, we're talking 70 years after the war. Let's just keep this to ourselves, okay? So, which, which proved to me how these stories remain. Every single person in that village knows what every single other person in that village was doing during that war. And, and, they, and they have for years and years and years and years. And so, so-and-so won't let his kid go shopping in that store because during the war, the guy was a collaborator or, you know, these kinds of things. Then this really exists. and. Uh, it kind of answered my question too about why the French don't re readily smile so much, you know. When you're occupied, you don't know who's on what side kind of thing. So um, so that was very interesting. And of course, I read a lot of, of books. I read a lot of nonfiction books about that. I wanted to get the history right. And I, I was very lucky because my husband is a PhD in history from the Sorbonne and it's his um, passion and he corrected, believe me, he corrected any errors I made, because if you make an error in a date, even if it's, even and especially if it's fiction, that'll kill your story. I mean, nobody will believe you. You know, it's just this lack of credibility. So I absolutely wanted to be credible, and I made a big effort to, to do that. So um, let me see. I think we can get maybe to the uh, slides now. And I, I, I have these slides because I wanted to uh, kind of situate the historical context of this war in France. Okay, so this is, this is Paris. And this gentleman here, uh, who uh, just is absolutely desperate, um, is watching the German troops walk, uh, marching down the Champs Elysees. And um, he's stunned and he's appalled and he's aghast. And wouldn't you be too, if you're on Park Avenue and you're watching, I don't know who, take over the United States, just try to imagine how you would feel. Well, that's how he felt. And the other people behind him feel the same way. It's horrible. Uh, it was really a blitzkrieg. And no, the, uh, the, the French generals, I think everybody agrees, uh, messed everything up because they thought that the Maginot line that they had that was built in the 30s along the eastern border of France was going to keep the Germans out but nobody thought that they were going to come through the Ardennes and that they were going to come in tanks and that they were going to plow through they did it so fast it was such a lightning attack that oof, it was all over so soon and so I just tell you about the reactions of my characters to this because I want my my slides or to you know humanize this a little bit. Severine, our, our wonderful Severine, 
um, our wonderful self-involved Serene. She is, she's like him, she's stunned. Her sister, Carolyn, is furious. And um, her husband thinks that the Germans deserve their victory. Her husband was a World War I hero and he was just astonished and uh, totally depressed by the fact that the Germans got such an easy win because of the stupidity of the French generals. So that's how that played out. I'll uh, we'll take the next slide. What did this bring about, this occupation? Well, it brought about deprivation and uh, tickets and spending your life in line for food. The, I read up on the French uh, rations and uh, they were, they had a 1,200 calories a day uh, when the normal daily rate of calories for adults and certainly for children and old people is 2,000 at least. So they were way down and they, it was one of the strictest um, uh, in Europe, actually, the French, you know, people always say the French are so slim and spelt. Well, they certainly were during the war because they couldn't find any food. And when they did, it was horrible food. But anyway, um, so they were also were in line for coal and leather and material and everything that the Germans took because the Germans took everything that was good and left the, the what was left to the French. Um, one day I was in my mother-in-law's kitchen and we're peeling potatoes or something like that together. And she looks over at me and my job and she sees potato peelings are kind of, you know, stacking up and they're nice and thick and stuff. And she says, <laughs> she says, well, I see you didn't live during the war or through the war kind of thing. At the time I said, oh, that's kind of a mother-in-law thing to say. <laughs> She's trying to tell me I don't know how to peel potatoes. But afterwards, and especially when I did research for this book, I said, oh my goodness, oh, you know, they didn't have anything, they were so deprived. And in that generation, now, of course, the newer, the younger generation, it's not at all the same thing, but uh, uh, they, they, they never forgot the war. And all of these older people, I, I know so many uh, really, really older people, older even than I am, <laughs> no, old, older people who would now probably be dead, but um, who, who kept everything from string to broken china to you know they were they were really afraid it was going to happen again so it did mark people very much we can go to the next slide and i'll show you what severine saw as she was walking in the streets of paris well what she saw was a german town and it was on german time i, d I don't have a photo here of a of a of a clock but all the clocks were on german time all the road signs, all the signs indicating where things were, were in German. You will notice they're not, I think, in French at all. Um, so, oh yeah, well, actually a little bit, but everything was in German. Uh, and then there were all these uh, insulting uh, to uh, posters, you know, saying, trust the German soldier, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be fine. You know, just put yourself in our hands and everything's gonna be great, okay? So that's what people saw when they walked through the streets. And then I'll take the next one. Uh, this is, uh, these two are pictures of um, some very stunning pictures. This was the meeting between uh, Hitler with Pétain uh, when they uh, shook hands uh, on, uh, on France's becoming a, a collaborationist government. And, um, you have to remember that uh, Marshal Patin was the hero of World War I. He was an old man, but he looked up to and respected very much. And here he is shaking Hitler's hand. So this was, you know, quite the occurrence. And uh, he justified, or I'd read some of the justifications for uh, Patin's collaborating was he thought he would get a better deal maybe if he could be on that kind of a, uh, have that kind of rapport with the Germans. But of course that was not true at all, the Germans just uh, made of that. It was a puppet government and he was just as bad as they were or even worse. So that was uh, in about in October 40. Now over here on the other side is a result of Pétain, the Vichy, Vichy regime uh, that he brought about. Uh, it, there were laws on the statues of the Jews. And as part of that, there was an exhibition um, in the Jew in the France. This is a, a photo of it. It was uh, near the Opéra that it took place. Also went to the provinces. 
and it's Le Juif et la France. And uh, it, it was uh, staged uh, with the help of the Germans, of course, and the Vichy regime. And inside, it was absolutely um, ignominious, ignominious um, you know, telling of uh, the French who the Jew was, probably to justify these statutes. And I think I might have just enough time to read a little passage in my book, also to show how I mix true uh, true events um, as ha happening in France at that time with the fictional story, um, how I wend it in together. So um, Carolyn and Severine are together and uh, Severine is horrified because she's uh, come unexpectedly to see, um, sorry, uh, Severine has come unexpectedly to see Carolyn and she sees Carolyn sewing a yellow star on her jacket. So she says to her, uh, what are you doing? You're not Jewish. Why are you selling on, sewing on a star? And, uh, she, and Carolyn says, well, it's out of, it's out of solidarity and uh, a sympathy. And here's what Severine says. She says, don't you, this, don't you know this is no time for pranks? If you're detained by the police, even when they see you're not Jewish, they won't appreciate your sympathy for those who are, believe me. It's not only sympathy, Carolyn protested. The Germans are wrong to arrest the Jews, to force them to wear this ridiculous star. And the French police, at least the ones I've seen, are as despicable as the Germans. She scrutinized her sister, but Severine's face was unreadable. Well, don't you hate the whole thing too, she demanded. She'd never figured out Severine's politics, although she knew Antoine's all too well. Like their parents, he was for Pétain. Unlike their parents, however, who were passive supporters, he was active, very active. She shivered slightly as she thought about the cold January day she'd happened by the Boulevard des Italiens, where a huge poster advertising an exposition at the Palais Berlitz called The Jew and France had caught her eye. She figured it would be ignominious, and it was. Inside the hall, she had stood in front of a rendition of the head of a, quote, typical Jew, unquote, with, she read on the descriptive label, his, quote, charnel, open mouth, thick lips, large, massive, and protruding ears, unquote. Filled with anger, revulsion, and shame, she had elbowed her way through the congested crowd, stopping only once to take in a delegation of important looking people, listening raptly to their well-dressed and knowledgeable guide, Antoine. She had never told Severine about that day. So there we have an example of, uh, of a real, something real in French history. And I'm working it into the, to the novel and as a scene between the two, the two sisters. Okay, Dutch, if you want to get the next one. Um, now, this time around, it's Serene who's going to use Vichy for her own purposes. Everybody's using some, somebody for something. Um, here on this side, the, the, the two houses here, though, that, those were real posters that I, I took pictures of at an exhibition I attended on the war. Um, so this was a poster that you could see at the time. Uh, and the yellow house is the new France with its new motto. Uh, the old motto of France was liberty, uh, fraternity and equality. The new motto is gonna be work, family and fatherland. The old house is crumbling down. It's got, you know, it's got the Star of David on the top of it. So that was apparently the worst thing, but there were also Freemasons and there are all kinds of words written on those uh, stones underneath it. Um, so that France is out. And this is the new one of law and order and, uh, you know, families and things like that. And then speaking of families, and this is a recurring theme in the book, Severine wants a baby, Severine wants a family. So this is kind of good for Severine in her argument with Antoine, who doesn't want children. And she, uh, so she says to Antoine, you know, Antoine, I saw a poster. Oh, I should translate this. I'm sorry. This is um, a household without a child is a, a wayward couple couple going astray, you know, and you've got to have children. So she says, you know, Antoine, I saw this poster on a wall the other day, I was walking home. In fact, two posters in different places. The first one said, 
if you want to rebuild France, first give her children. The second one said, a household without a child, a couple adrift. She didn't tell him how powerfully the second poster had struck her as she stood transfixed, contemplating the young couple perched on a raft in a rough sea with high winds that had shredded the mast. She had drawn closer and stared at it so intensely that the couple had seemed to transform itself into her, into herself and Antoine before her eyes. She felt as if Marshal Patin was speaking directly to her. What kind of patriot was she in wartime if she didn't have a family? And patriotism aside, what kind of life would she have without children in it? Why didn't Antoine understand this? Why was she the only one of the two who wanted a child? And then she continues with Antoine, but she's used the, the poster to, for her own purposes. Um, now in the next slide, what do you do when you're occupied? Do you resist? Do you collaborate? Of course, you'd love to say you'd resist. We all do. Not so sure we would, but if you did resist, in France, you could, for example, really uh, resisting, you could join what they call the Maquis. And that's why I said, remember I told you Perigora was a very wooded area? Well, the woods are important because they were in small rural towns. And outside of those towns in the Perigord were, were woods where you could hide and not be seen. The Germans couldn't find people in those woods. It was almost impossible. The local people knew them, but the Germans couldn't find them. So inside those woods, the, the Maquisar would train to um, kill, uh, to use arms to kill the Nazis and um, to sabotage. And they, they learned all kinds of techniques um, to vanquish the enemy. Uh, on the other side, if you were uh, with the Milice, then you were with the Vichy regime and you were uh, with the collaborators and against the Milice. So this was, but, I should have drawn something right in between them because the most of the people in France, about 80% of the people in France didn't resist and they didn't collaborate or at least actively. There were passive resistors. There were people who were in favor maybe of collaboration, but we're talking about people who were really active. And interestingly enough, the numbers are about the same on each side, about 300, 400,000. So, um, uh, in the book, we have many different examples of different uh, conduct. Uh, uh, Severine's first boyfriend, Paul, joins the secret army, which is um, de Gaulle, the, a Gaullist uh, organization. Luke is a communist resistant, and the communists were very powerful. Carolyn is a passive resistant, you know, when she's sewing on her yellow star, that's her way of, of showing her disapproval. Um, and Antoine is an active collaborator and the parents and Severine and a lot of other people are in a wait and see position. They don't really know. All, actually, all they want to do is just get it over with, the war. So, so in my last slide, um, the war now is ending. Um, the allies are coming. Uh, the tide is turning. Here we have a very famous picture. You may have seen it. It was ta taken by Robert Kappa in the Chartres, where the beautiful cathedral is. And here is a head shaven woman. You can see her with a little baby in her arms, and the policeman right next to her. She is being paraded, marched through the streets. People are jeering, laughing, having the best old time. It's kind of like a, a parade or something. Uh, probably some of those people in there are real happy that nobody's looking at them and they were Johnny come lately resistance. Um, but it was a terrible period of time, a, a shame, a total shame, uh, uh, this public humiliation. But there was worse than that. And that was already pretty bad. And the worst was what I was telling you about, which is called those wild purges, that summary justice when people were just taken out and uh, with no t trial were uh, assassinated or done away with. And uh, there were about 10,000 people, 10,000 people were done away with like that from uh, according to the history books, estimating it. Whereas once the goal set up trials in which people were judged actually, were, were actually given a trial to find out if they had actively collaborated, uh, there were, um, 
1,500 collaborators who were executed at war's end after the legal trial. Um, so um, just one little personal remark there, a friend, a great friend of uh, my husband's parents, my in-laws, was a prefect, like a kind of a governor, uh, and uh, during the Vichy regime, he was a prefect before and he stayed on, like most, most of them did. Uh, most of them, many of them stayed on because they thought that maybe they could help the French and they weren't gonna resign their posts. Um, but he stayed on and at the end of the war, the, the uh, group of resistors came to take him out and shoot him. And he is standing there ready to be shot and that's gonna be the end of his life. And uh, they changed their minds and they left. So these are also, this is also war. So there he is, he, he was revoked, but I mean, being revoked is different than being shot. So, you know, the various uh, degrees of how you're gonna be treated for whatever you did. Um, but I'd like to finish this. And before I, I go back to Dutch, who has been so patient, <laughs> I'd like to finish this with a quote by a very famous French writer whose name is Francois Mauriac. He says, Revenge disguised as justice is our most horrendous grimace. In French is la vengeance déguisée en justice, c'est notre plus affreuse grimace. So I will leave you with that to think about and I'll give this back to, to Dutch and thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet, that was, that was wonderful. Um, and I, I appreciate that you had slides for us and I know our, our viewers at home, it's always something that's interesting and fun for, for all of us to get to see these visuals when, especially when we're talking about history um, and the accuracy of it, um, even in historical fiction, it, it, it adds another layer to it. So thank you for preparing that for us. Uh, so I just wanna to reiterate to everybody who's with us today, if you have any questions for Harriet, um, please just send them in the chat and then I'll start reading them and we can, we can have some real fun conversation. But uh, while people are, are writing some questions, Harriet, I have a few for you um, that maybe you can talk about. So you told us uh, about your journey from nonfiction to fiction. Um, yeah. So what, what was some of the challenges about that? Um, I mean, I, I have to assume that there, there were some hard hard patches at the uh, yes uh, there, there were, fiction. oh my goodness there were lots of very hard patches because um well i i um uh, i was a freelance journalist for many years so i i knew about writing i knew about reporting thank heavens mm -hmm. uh i knew about writing nonfiction, but um it fixes it's just a different world it's like being uh, somebody who was an athlete and being a champion swimmer and then doing mountain hiking you've got to learn a new you know a new sport and so uh, that's what I had to do. And I just plunged into it uh, any old way I could. I uh, read uh, some wonderful, I mean, there are many books, how to write a best-selling novel, how to write a novel. Blah, blah. I found one that I particularly liked by a, a writer. She's an American writer, her name is Elizabeth George. And uh, it seemed to me to be the one that attracted me the most. And she seemed to tell me the things that I wanted to hear. So I, I read that back and forth. Then I, I went to a writer's, I was lucky enough to be selected uh, for a writer's workshop with the, uh, the head of the Iowa Writer's Workshop, uh, Samantha Chang, and that took place in Paris. And uh, that was early on in the novel, but it was wonderfully helpful. So she, was, she gave me some very, very good advice as I started. And at the end, when I finished, uh, I, you, pr you probably know the American, famous American writer, Diane Johnson, who wrote The Divorce and who wrote the script for The Shining. Well, she lives in Paris and uh, I, I showed her part of what I'd written. And she gave me a piece of very good advice too. So I was, you know, I had my eyes and my ears open to what people were gonna tell me. I, you know, you could take or leave advice. I also left a lot of advice, but the good advice I took. Um, but it, it was very, very tough going. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you don't mind, what was some of that advice that you got or like, what was something that yeah. stuck that sticks with you okay um for example uh diane johnson mm -hmm. i showed her this passage in the book well i know i showed her a chapter and she very very delicately uh said to me don't you think it severine was doing something gross okay 
it's so gross, I won't even say what she was doing. <laughs> but she was doing something gross. And she said, maybe you should wait until your readers get to know her better yeah. before you have her do that. And that was a very nice way of saying, this is just, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> And so uh, I'd had two other people had read it and they had read the same thing and not said anything. So I went back to them and I said, well, what did you think about when Severine was doing it? And they said, oh, well, they said they were very polite too. They said, well, it was really not very attractive, you know, <laughs> other words, in other words, it was gross. And yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay. <laughs> they, they didn't tell you the truth at, when you when you needed no. it. No. <laughs> so what did I do? Um, I didn't have her do that. I had her do something else. I changed her behavior. So she looked a little bit more symp sympathetic, and she would have done, you know, it was something in in character with her, but not to mm -hmm. such an extent. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's one one example. <laughs> <laughs> what if, um, so we have a few questions that have come in. Um, so people want to know this relationship with your mother-in-law um has was she able to get to experience the book no unfortunately she passed away before the book came out and uh i always say i wouldn't have published the book if she had been alive mm -hmm. because i really loved and respected my mother-in-law and i never would have made public something that she would first of all you know she wouldn't have read it because it would have been in english and she didn't speak english yeah uh, and I had changed, you know, so many things, but still, still, no, I couldn't, no. So I wouldn't have done that. But, uh, you know, it took me so long to write it, <laughs> unfortunately, that by that time she was dead. There were only two people left who knew that story intimately. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that was the, the follow-up question is, um, how is the book received by uh, any anyone uh, in Philippe's family, um, your husband's family? So well, you know, there, I'm assuming there's not many, you said. Well, yeah, uh, there were two people left. Um, uh, yeah, his sister, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, 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 her, and the niece of the of the character of the of the real person, the niece of the aunt, yeah. who has the same name. <laughs> so I said to Philippe, "Okay, look, it's not because I'm a chicken, but it's because of the French." I said, "You in France, you know, this is often true." You, you, you can speak a language, you know, all the nuances, you know, even the slang, you know, but it's still, there are certain things that are better said by a French person and especially with his family. Mm -hmm. If I had said, I would have tripped all over myself and I don't know what I would, oh goodness. So he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell them. So he did, he called each of them up and he said, you know, here he's written this book and it's about, uh, it's about so and so, but not really because it's a novel and she's changed the name. And you know what they said? The sister who was the one I was most afraid of, she said, oh, that's great, no problem. <gasps> and I said, I cannot believe this. I have been feeling guilt for 20 years. Yeah. I should have asked her before, you don't ask permission to write a, you know. So I said, oh my, I cannot believe this. This is just, and the other one too, exactly the same. Yeah. So it's that, it's that maybe a harder exterior, but they're, they're interested and they, it's, it's, it's a story. It's a, we, I think everyone has family narratives and family. Well, stories. yeah, everybody has a family narrative. But what I think is interesting is that I, the, the, uh, the outsider, the in-law, yeah. took upon the family's uh, trauma more than they did. Yeah. Well, did really? You, what, what about Philippe's experience? Did he feel like um, that the research that you guys did together, was it I have to imagine it was, it probably was really special for him to get to experience that. Like you say, it was such a small town and so individual of these perspectives that generations later, they still know each other's neighbors yeah. and, and their stories that him getting to experience that has to feel special. It was, it was very moving. You know, this person, yeah. I mean, he was a little boy on the back. Yeah. Of this aunt, even though he doesn't remember it. But it was a very, very, very moving uh, uh, weekend, and you know, going to see these people and going to, see, uh, you know, there were things I didn't put in that book that really happened in the real story. Mm -hmm. Other people, uh, people who were killed and who were in the cemetery down there, and we went to see their graves and we heard their stories, and you know, it was just very, very, uh, very uh, moving. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, 
Well, so while while we we speak about this true story and it moving it into fiction, what would be what would be some other uh, pieces of, of literature or television or films that I mean, this is a time period that people love. And like you said, yeah. this is just one tiny vignette of exactly. World War II and, and yes. the experience that reached across the globe. But exactly. what would be some other interesting snippets or views or perspectives? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a good question. And before, you know, I, I did leave something out when I was talking about research. I wanted to tell you that Philippe, uh, because he's an historian and he had permission, he went to the uh, military archives mm -hmm. uh, at the Fort de Vincennes in Paris. You don't get into that easily. And he went and he saw the records of the gendarmerie at that period of time. And he saw his aunt's name on the list because wow. everybody was called Gestapo. Everybody in the town was called Gestapo because of the politics of, yeah. you know, and that was very shocking experience. Yeah. You know, his aunt was not Gestapo, but anyway, so that's, those are those kinds of things. I wanted to bring that up about the research because when we were in that little town, speaking of research, this is a book, it's in French only. It's called Journal sous l'occupation Perigo. It's a, it's a journal written by none other than the um, mother-in-law of André Moroy, who was a very French, uh, very famous French writer. And he was Jewish and he and his wife, who was her daughter, were in New York. So she's writing letters to her daughter in New York and, and uh, to friends and family. So this is what happened actually down there in Perigord in that very town. And I read this book, I bought it in the bookstore and I, and I read it and I saw, I, I almost died when I saw that she related the event. She, she had been a witness. So, you know, all this brings this home. You see, I, you know, I'm not making up, I mean, I'm making up things, but you know, so that's one thing. Oh, but back to the books that people could read. Uh, one book I really liked is The Silence of the Sea. I don't know if you know that. It's a very famous book. It was written, it was published clandestinely in 1941 by a French man who took a pseudonym, called himself Vercors, V-E-R-C-O-R-S. And it was made into a film by Jean-Pierre Melville in 1949. Um, and it is, it's very short and very powerful because it's all about passive resistance. Very briefly, it's about a, a family whose home is requisitioned and a, the Germans all come in and the uncle and the niece sit there at every night. This German, he's not a bad guy. Mm -hmm. In fact, he's a good guy. He loves France. He loves France's culture. And he's, he thinks that the two nations should be all this kind of stuff. And they're not having it. And they, they don't speak to him. And it's, it's so painful to read because it's painful in the movie too. The guy comes in and, does, you know, blah, blah. And they're just, she's absorbed in her you know, sewing and the uncle's just, like this, oh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing piece of work about passive resistance. So that's one. And the next one, I'm sure many of you know already, The Sweet Francaise, Irene Nemirovsky. And that too was written during the war. So I liked, I liked reading the books that were written at the time. At the time, yeah. yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, it gives, you would hope that it gives so, a, a truthful experience to, to the reader or to the watcher. Um, well, it's always the truth of the person who's writing it, but still, it gives you, yeah. Truth. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so we got an, an, an interesting question that I think um, you'd like to answer um, from the audience. So did your small town Iowa experience influence your understanding of a small town in the Southwest of France? Oh, I love that question. That's great. Absolutely. How can you understand a small town if you haven't grown up in a small town? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> they and you know even today people say that about my my small town. The name of it is Shenandoah, Iowa, not Shenandoah, West Virginia. Shenandoah, Iowa. And newcomers to the town are people who who weren't born there. They don't have grandparents there. I mean, I have roots there since the Iowa became a state, mm -hmm. and I was very rooted. And I thought everybody. I knew had those roots, the root, but they don't. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. So I know about small towns. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they really helped me a lot. Yeah. Well, so it, what was it like leaving that small town? Um, well, when I was growing up in that small town, I always wanted to get out of it. 
<laughs> because um, I just knew that there was glamour somewhere. I remember one summer there was uh, family friends and they came from New York and their little girl and I got together and she said, oh, I would love to live in your town. It's so quiet. It's so nice. And I said, I'd like to live in your town. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you swap. The grass is always greener. Greener, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I know now. I mean, so many years on, uh, I, I think it was a very special time, and I, I was very, um, you know, it's very special to grow up in a town where you have your uncles and your aunts and your grandpa and your grandma out on the farms near you, and yep. you know, it's, it's, it was a very special way to grow up. Yeah, I, my, my family is the exact same way. It's a small old town, and everyone's in a three mile radius yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's nice. yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah. so before we wrap up i have one last question which uh you probably can anticipate but people want to know what are you working on next are you going to go yeah. nonfiction? are you going to stay fiction maybe a little of both what are we thinking um what i'm thinking is i don't have an idea you know as i said final transgression presented itself to me yep. it was a story that i just jumped into and a, a french toast too both of those were books i had to write yeah. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm turning things over in my mind. If I were lazy, which I am, <laughs> I would write another book about the French, you know, the nonfiction kind of thing, Yeah. Uh, just to be lazy. Um, but if I were not lazy, I would uh, try to develop some more because I loved writing that fiction book. Yeah. I really did. Well, so we, we hope that you're, lazy. you're lazy and not lazy. We, we, we <laughs> yeah, both. maybe, right, maybe both. Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. yeah. it's, this is, it really is, it's wonderful getting to see an author uh, change path and, and get celebrated doing both. Um, yeah. And I know it's, it's something that a lot of our readers here at the Library Society have, have loved and checked out. Um, so I'm sure there's people who want you to keep, keep doing fiction. And I'm sure, yeah. I'm positive, really, that the, the, our nonfiction readers would love another uh, inside the French mindset. Ah, uh, okay. Well, listen, you're encouraging me here. This is yeah. good. This is good. <laughs> but I, I really that's enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, speaking. I didn't have on my little gallery view, so I don't know. I know that Dana Pitts is there. Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dana. <laughs> She's responsible for me being here. Yes, so, yeah, we, we, we want to thank her again, and we want to thank yeah. you. Um, right. I know that it not, maybe not everybody caught this in the very beginning, but you are in, in France right now, so we're, we're okay. at a complete time difference right now. And it's, right. it's lectures like this and Zooms like this that we, we get to really appreciate our, our being of the Library Society and our members get to appreciate um, these experiences. So thank you for that. Um, this you. has been a lot of fun. I'm sure we're going to be in contact and get to talk to each other. So next time you're, you're over this way, <laughs> let us oh, know. I would love to by. be over. <laughs> I would yeah. love to be over your way and come and visit you at your library. <laughs> You're, you're always invited. We'd love to have you back for an in-person lecture. So uh, yes. everybody, if you have not purchased this book, it Buxton Books, our local bookseller at 160 King Street. Um, we have the link on our website. You can you can pop over there. Um, and Harriet, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Dutch. And thank you, Anne, and everybody there. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Wonderful. And your lunch hour. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and your dinner hour. So it, it's perfect. <laughs> it's not dinner hour yet in France. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, <you're on. laughs> all right. Well, have a great night. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Right, bye. Bye-bye.